Our third speaker is someone who may be well known to a lot of people here is Sue McCluskey, who's had a lot of involvement in advocacy in the agriculture sector, um, particularly at the NFF. Um, and Sue's role at the moment, amongst other things, is as one of the members of the panel, uh, the Harper Review, looking at the future of competition policy and competition laws in Australia. So uh, she's uh, right up to her neck, I could say, in uh, some of these issues at the moment. And she's explained to me that uh, she only just got back here from Western Australia. She had uh, uh, an interesting day yesterday explaining to the chief executives and others of Coles and uh, West Farmers uh, the merits of their proposal, which apparently they don't quite see in the same light. So no doubt Sue will tell us about that as part of her discussion this morning. Thanks, Sue. Down. I was too short to get up on the stage. And I'm not the son of a farmer's daughter, and I'm not a farmer's daughter. I'm actually a farmer myself. So um, some of this context, you'll see that I'll actually bring that plus um, the hat I wear when I'm not doing competition policy, which is with the Regional Australia Institute. What I'm going to do is actually take you across the context of the Harper Review, the Review of Competition Policy. Um, and take you through some of the areas we're looking at and also, as I go through, really try and encourage you. Uh, there's not much time left, but to provide input to us because um, it's probably fair to say that from the agriculture and agribusiness sector, we have not had a lot of input into the review and there's some particular areas that we're really keen to hear from. Let's try that. There we go. The Harper Review, chaired by Professor Ian Harper, a panellist Peter Anderson, who is the former CEO of the Australian Chamber of Commerce and, and Industry, and Michael O'Brien QC, who's a competition lawyer, and myself. Uh, the panel was actually established in March this year. It is a 12-month process. Uh, we released our draft report in September. Um, very broad terms of reference we were given. And prior to that draft report coming out, we had an issues paper. We probably met with around 100 different stakeholders. We did con uh, conduct public consultation all around the country. We received about 100, 350 submissions to that uh, issues paper that actually helped us form the draft report. In the draft report itself, we've actually gone very much into specific recommendations uh, for a couple of reasons. One is we didn't just want to give a general direction because we thought it would help people respond if we were quite specific about where we were heading. The other is through the consultation, it was a very extensive consultation process, uh, we did come to a view in quite a number of areas. So we have put out of those 52 recommendations, most of them are very specific. There are some areas we we've actually identified as being where we'd like some further feedback. Since that draft report came out, we've undertaken a further consultation round. So we've done public consultations in every state. Uh, we've also met with as many stakeholders as we possibly can. And as Mick said, um, been in Perth the last couple of days, so red-eyed it back last night or this morning. The context for this review, of course, uh, builds on the Hilma review of uh, the 1990s. So it's over 20 years since we had uh, a competition policy review of this size and impact. And we were very mindful of the fact that when we looked at what are the reforms necessary in this area, that we can't just think what has changed since the 1990s, but how do we actually position ourselves for the future? And some of the things that couldn't have been contemplated at the time Fred Hilmer did his report were just the, the glowing increase in the impact globalisation has. On, on our businesses and the way we operate here in Australia. The, the ageing population, just the impact that will have, not just now but into the future, and the digital revolution. When Fred Hilmer wrote his report 20 years ago, uh, you didn't have the internet then. And so the, the amazing advances that technology has brought to us, look at Uber, look what Uber's doing to the taxi industry, uh, look at what online newspapers have done to news agents. So things have certainly moved on since Hilma and we were very mindful of that but we also had to think about how do we actually make sure that our competition laws, policies and institutions are not just right for now but can actually be right into the future. 
we did look through those three buckets of, of work and, and they were really the areas that we were able to categorise what we were looking at. Interestingly, in relation to the competition law, uh, when we started this, we perhaps didn't think that there was a lot we would say about that, that it would actually be part of the process that came after uh, the government uh, responding to our report. But in actual fact, and it's probably largely due to having Michael O'Brien on the, the panel, uh, he actually identified that there are a lot of areas in the law that we could look to simplify and give greater clarity. So that's certainly what we've done. But then in the areas of competition policy and institutions, we've also had quite a bit to say. And what we've done is we've actually viewed all this through the lens of fit for purpose. Our competition laws, policies and institutions fit for purpose, not just for today, but into the future. And what we've also done is put consumers very much at the heart of competition policy. We've actually said this is all about consumers. And when you think of businesses, particularly small businesses, quite often they do act as consumers in quite a lot of markets. We've also put choice very much there. So we've said choice is very important. We've got to be able to allow people to have choice. We shouldn't restrict it. We've also got to ensure that competition policy can encourage and allow for innovation, because certainly innovation is what is going to lead to those productivity increases, increases to GDP. Simplification, of course, around efficient and clear law and clear policies, but very importantly, access and equity. And this is one of the things that I've been very mindful of when we've looked at the area of uh, human services. And that is, it's one thing to say that we need to give choice but some of those remote areas, choice is second order. It's actually basic access in the first place. So it's something we've been very mindful of. So let's look at competition policy first. And I think it goes without saying that the panel certainly believes that it needs invigorating. Uh, when we saw what Hilmer did, there was certainly reform of government monopolies. You know, we saw in electricity uh, and, and some of those other areas. And we are actually saying now, that that reform should apply to all activities of government. In other words, there, there shouldn't be areas of government uh, that we actually see as being a monopoly. Uh, we do underpin everything with a public interest test. So we say, unless uh, there is no other way to actually ensure you are, are addressing the public interest than by restricting competition, that there shouldn't be that restriction. And so we've looked at regulation and we've said we've actually got to remove barriers to entry. Uh, to entry because that is what actually stifles innovation and growth. And of course there was unfinished business from Hilma. Now I don't need to tell you of course that uh, no matter what we say and as an independent panel the report we provide to government, government will, will of course respond to eventually, we hope, uh, politics always plays a part. And so a lot of the unfinished business from Hilma was due to a lot of the politics. Uh, trading hours, coming back from the West, they still have restricted trading hours. And when you try to tell them that over in the East, you actually can go into a supermarket after five o'clock in the evening, they don't quite believe you. A um, lot of pressure, though, coming from over there uh, in relation to lifting trading hour restrictions, particularly from independent supermarkets who see that, you know, that's where a lot of their business comes from. Uh, interestingly, when we look at what's happened uh, in the East where they don't have the restrictions of, of trading hours in most of those states, uh, there's actually been different markets or different opportunities for those independent supermarkets, but certainly a real issue there. Taxis, interestingly, because taxis is quite different from state to state. And of course, we've got to recognise that a lot of these uh, issues will be subject to state regulation. But taxis over in the West, they're actually letting Uber come into the marketplace. Uh, and when we talked to them earlier this week, they said they're still to see um, greater choice and, and greater access being offered, but they see that that will come. Whereas I think in Queensland, what we're seeing is moves for that state to actually restrict Uber to a large extent. So it will be interesting to see how that plays off. Uh, pharmacies, of course, we've made recommendations about removing ownership and location rules around pharmacies. Um, the pharmacists, certainly the owners, pharmacists don't particularly like that. But the employee pharmacists are actually saying that these, they see it as a barrier to entry. They are prevented from owning pharmacists. So it is something that we will see how that plays out in terms of how our recommendations may actually be taken forward. 
Then they're the new reform areas, and I have to say that this is an area that the panel sees as being the area of greatest opportunity. If we can look at reform in the area of human services, so health, education, aged care, disability, uh, we can get the greatest productivity gains. Uh, and certainly look at what we can do in, you know, to, to relate to what Hilma got in terms of the uh, productivity growth and gains. On the other hand, this is probably an area where we have had very little input. Uh, we don't know if it's because the sectors within this see this competition policy as being an economic issue, not a social issue, um, or whether they've just not seen that they need to engage. We've made very specific moves to try and establish roundtables and forums to try and get that input. Uh, we take heed from what they've done in the UK, which is perhaps progressed almost too quickly, and so it's an area we need to proceed with caution. Um, but certainly we see there are opportunities, and when you think of it, uh, in health, you've got a lot of pro private providers now. You have private hospitals, the same in education. You have private schools. Aged care, a lot of aged care facilities are private. Disability, of course, we've got the NDIS. So it's not as if we're not moving into those areas. And, and it's not just about government and purely private. A lot of NGOs have the opportunity to operate here, a lot of cooperatives. Um, so we certainly see this is probably the area of greatest gain. And we do get asked if there was one thing that you would say that government needed to look at doing, this would be the area that we would say uh, is really what would set us up for the future. In relation to the competition law, uh, as I said, we looked at focusing on enhancing public benefit over the long term. Importantly, and this is, I'll come back to this when I talk about section 46, it's about protecting competition, not individual competitors. So it's not about protecting an individual business, it's about competition in that marketplace. And that's where we've actually got to look at getting that right balance between innovation and competitiveness. As we've gone around with our consultation, uh, we've had a lot of people, uh, particularly small businesses, talk about competitiveness issues. Competition policy is not just about competitiveness. It, if we strike the right balance, we can enhance competitiveness, but this isn't about prices and trying to do something there. This is actually more broader. And of course, when we looked at the law, it really was about how do we make it as simple as possible. The key change, and look, we keep saying it to people that this was not a review on section 46, but that's just about all you ever read in the media. And it's uh, what most people at the public consultations have said to us. Um, fair to say it's probably been the recommendation that has the greatest area of debate. What we've tried to do with section 46 is not listen to all the noise that's been uh, that we've heard, but really say, how do we actually make sure that it's consistent with the rest of the Act? And it's actually the only provision that focuses on competitors, not competition. So we've actually aligned it so it does look at uh, misuse of market power uh, on competition. The other thing we'd be very mindful of is that market power in itself is not against the law. And indeed, when you think of it, anyone who's actually out there in business, wouldn't it be great if you had the market to yourself? Uh, but, you know, you also uh, know that when you do have that, the, the actual business can get fat and lazy. So competition actually enhances the process and makes it actually better for, for people, particularly for consumers. So we've actually said that it's the misuse of market power that actually needs to be the focus of this. So the changes we've provo proposed in relation to Section 46 really go about focusing on competition and about making sure that it focuses on the misuse of market power. We have looked at the purpose and effect of that, which actually makes it consistent with section 45 and section 47. Um, we still have, have probably, as I said, two camps of thought. Some say we haven't gone far enough. Others say we have gone too far and we will chill competition. This is a draft report, so we are actually encouraging people to uh, to give us examples uh, where they say it chills competition, give us examples of other jurisdictions in the world where they have the same sort of test and it hasn't had that impact. And for people who say we need to go further, um, what more do we need to do? And once again, I'll come back to that when I talk about access to remedies. Simpler authorisation notification processes um, and also collective bargaining. It was interesting to hear Rod talk about uh, providing us with some more input in relation to this. We're really keen to get this, and once again, I would encourage you, 
uh, to, to let us know what we can do to improve this process. I have had a lot of people say to me, Sue, we don't use the collective bargaining process because it just doesn't work for us. Why doesn't it work? We want to know why it doesn't work. What can we do? We have looked to try and simplify it. We have looked to put in things such as block exemptions. We have looked to try and reduce the time, the paperwork. We have looked to see if it's possible for, say, a peak body uh, to, to do that on behalf of a, a collection of farmers. What we see is that it will start to help give you more market power. If that's not going to help you because there are other reasons we're not aware of, we need to know. We need to know pretty soon. So very keen for you to let us know that. In relation to the formal merger processes, we've actually looked at, once again, addressing the, the issues around time limits, uh, the clearance process. In actual fact, there is a formal process that just doesn't get used. It's the informal process through the ACCC. So we're actually saying the ACCC should be the first point of call uh, with the tribunal being effectively the review process. I want to mention competitive neutrality because this actually um, I think before we started this process and before we undertook the consultations wasn't something we thought was a big issue. But as we went around the consultations, particularly in regional areas, the issue of competitive neutrality kept coming up. And that's where business actually competes with government. It might be in waste disposal, it might be in caravan parks where the local council lets uh, caravans stay on the showground for you know, a nominal fee. And so we've actually proposed changes in relation to competitive neutrality where we actually say it should be extended from where government doesn't just act in business but acts in trade and commerce. Fair to say that I think most of the states are not happy with, with what we've said there. We want to explore it further. Is there a balance that we can strike there? Um, there is an issue where government has an adva advantage when it actually competes with business. Um, so once again, in relation to those particular recommendations we've made, we're keen to get more input into what impact that has. There was an interesting example that was given to us, I think it was in Charleville, uh, where the local picture theatre um, was doing fine until the local council thought they would install um, a projector and fund the projector in the council chambers because it would bring in more tourists. Um, once again, you know, the, the poor picture theatre guy who'd been operating his business for quite a long time, he said, how can I compete with this? So it's those issues. Is this a way to address it or is there a different way that we can do this? Access to remedies. Look, I've, I've particularly taken this to heart because when, once again, we were on the consultation process and we were looking at Section 46 and everyone said to us, you've got to change the law. And we said, why do we have to change the law? And they would say, because the law is not good enough, the ACCC can't take action. Um, when we complain, there's nothing they can do, so the law has to be changed. So we would say, well, if the ACCC aren't able to take on your case, why don't you do that yourself? And they'd say, well, we can't do that because we either don't have the time, we don't have the money, or we're basically not prepared to stick our necks up. So what it came down to was, in a lot of cases, it was access to remedies, dispute resolution. And for a lot of small businesses, and this applies to a lot of, of agriculture, it was the ability to, have, to not have their taste, case taken forward where they believed they had, they had a basis. So what we've said is, in the first place, we think the ACCC could be more proactive in terms of providing guidance to small businesses to look at where there is dispute res resolution, where they may not be able to take the case to help businesses understand if they do have a case or not. Because sometimes it might just be a case of a big business that is acting purely in the way that they would. And business can be rough and tumble. Uh, Gary mentioned that. Um, and so there isn't misuse of market power. So it's helping businesses understand that. But we also want to know if there's more we can do. One of the things we've started to explore is, is it possible to have a tribunal? that businesses could go to, which would be a low or no cost tribunal that could actually take cases on in a much more speedily way. To address the concern about does a business want to be identified, is it possible for a peak body to take action on behalf of the business so the business's identity is protected? Once again, we're really open to hearing what we can look to do in this area because it is an area of concern. And you know, no matter what we did to the law, if you can't fix this, it's not going to make any difference. 
In relation to institutions, uh, we've actually proposed a number of changes. A new national competition body, the Australian Council of Competition Policy, and that really is to be the advocate for competition policy. We've re recommended separating the access and pricing regulator. And then in relation to the ACCC, what we've done is we've actually said, let's focus the ACCC on regulating and, and being the competition and consumer regulator. We haven't separated those two functions. We think it's very important that they stay together, particularly as small business may fall through the cracks. Uh, but one of the things, and I think Rod will probably take this up uh, in questions, is we certainly agree with the market studies, but we think it actually should go to the uh, new competition body we're proposing rather than the ACCC itself. Next steps. The draft report is out now. Now, consultation goes, does go till next week. Uh, we will be a little bit flexible, but basically we have to provide our report to Minister Bilson by March next year. So we are certainly looking to uh, start working on that pretty quickly. Some of the, the things we do know we will be doing in the final report will be putting in a chapter that isn't in the draft on implementation. Uh, we feel we do need to give guidance to government as to what are the things they need to think about in relation uh, to implementation. For example, uh, in the taxi industry, certainly there is no intention that we are looking at completely deregulating, that there will be no safety standards or any other sort of regulation. It's really around the licensing. Uh, but also, you know, we have taxi drivers who say to us, I've spent a fortune on that licence, it's the equivalent of my superannuation and you're recommending taking that away. Well, there'll need to be transition measures put in place. Uh, there might be some structural adjustments. So they're the sort of things that we will probably need to highlight in the final report. There is a place on the website where you can have your say. So even if you just want to make a comment, you don't need to make a full submission. Uh, I do encourage you to go in and provide us with input. Um, this is. This competition policy is what is going to make things better for you. So we need to hear how things will actually work in practice and we're very open to hear from that and that will help form our views when we go to finalising that report. Thank you. I'll leave it there. Thank you.